Well, welcome once again to another episode of Trading Bell right here on KTN News. I am Brian Giorgiotiano. Today we are talking all matters real estate and there's no better person to speak to us about this. But Jason, he is an official at the Unity Homes, the much famed Unity Homes. We'll be talking about that in a short while. Jason, good to see you. Thank you very much. All right, for the viewer who is not appraised about Unity Homes, who are Unity Homes and what do they do? But first off, introduce yourself and then tell us about Unity Homes. Okay, so uh, my name is Jason Horsey. I'm one of the executive directors of Unity Homes. Okay. Uh, we started the business in 2015, really with the aim of providing really high quality housing and apartments mm -hmm. for a very reasonable price. So okay. our first project was in Eldoret, which was 240 units ranging from four to six million mm. shillings starting in 2015. Mm -hmm. We then moved to Tartu City um, uh, on the outskirts of Nairobi mm -hmm. um, in 2019 where we just launched the Unity West project which was 384 two and three bedroom apartments. Mm -hmm. um, that sold incredibly well and we finished selling the, pro the state middle of last year okay. at around about the same time we broke ground on the next project which is Unity East which is 640 two and three bedroom apartments, which at the moment we're, we're in this phase of building mm -hmm. and we've sold about a third of that estate already. And at the moment they're, they're, they're going for about $63,000. Mm -hmm. We've recently just broken ground on another project, which is uh, Unity One, which is a new one bedroom uh, apartment, which is mm -hmm. 1200 units, also mm -hmm. at Tartu City. We're extremely excited about this. They're mm -hmm. going for 37,500 and really, our aim is to really push down that pricing point mm -hmm. just to increase the, the amount of people who can who can afford them. So like we've extended our payment plans from two years to three years mm -hmm. just to broaden the net. We really want to widen the net as to people who can afford to buy our apartments. We've at the same time we've got um, about 600 apartments we've broken on a broken ground on a project in Nigeria, a new business that we started mm -hmm. there. So in total we've got about almost 3,000 apartments okay. under, uh, under projects at the moment. Um, sort of what differentiates our business then to other uh, developers okay. is uh, number one is we're vertically integrated. If you look at your traditional developer, mm -hmm. Um, what they do is they go out, they raise equity, and they actually outsource all the key functions of the value chain. So mm -hmm. they get engineers, they get architects, they get QSs, and then they get a contractor to undertake the work. Now, the problem is there's a serious lack of alignment there, because obviously these guys are all paid a percentage of the overall sum, mm -hmm. so they're really not incentivized to keep the cost down. Then the contractor comes in, He's, his objective is to come into the site, do as little as possible, get a certificate signed and leave. So there's really no alignment along that value chain. So what we did is we actually have brought all of those skills in-house. So we've got design, development, mm -hmm. construction, marketing, sales, all in-house. So we've been able to align that value chain, which is mm -hmm. utterly vital for uh, the execution of the product that we provide. Um, another thing is we, we've tried to set up the business on the terms of the construction side more like a factory than a construction side. You know, construction is inherently inefficient. Mm -hmm. um, you know, productivity in, in manufacturing in a factory is considerably better. There's been no productivity gains in construction for, I don't know what it is, sort of 50 years or something, or sure. marginal gains. Sure. So for example, this starts with the, the shells. So we bought this formwork from our uh, supplier in South Korea called Kum Kang Kind. Mm -hmm. And with basically the way it works, you assemble the formwork and you pour solid concrete. So, so, so essentially what we're doing is trying to remove as much artisanal input into the building mm -hmm. and automate it as much as possible by this factory made mold forming the shell of the, the unit. Then what happens is obviously all the finishing follows. So all the tiles, everything is identical. The tiles come in, the, the, the sockets go in, the, the granite goes in, and everything on all these units is identical. So it's really trying to mechanize the process as much as possible without actually mechanizing it. So the end result is we're able to produce a much better quality product um, for a very, very reasonable price because it's essentially basically like, uh, like a factory almost. Amazing. You, you sort of preempted my next question, which is going to be on how Unity Homes is able to produce this very affordable units, but high quality at while at it. And just a bit, a bit of stati statistics from Kenya, really. There's a demand of almost 200,000 units, housing mm. units annually, talking about families that need housing units, um, the young professionals who are looking to own homes and the like. 
uh, the government alone is able to provide 50,000 units, which mm. leaves a very huge gap right there, 150,000 units um, annual supply, which of course may or may not be met by the private sector. And the, the, the question then is, how then are you able to fund all of this and now your interest in the exchange currently? Mm. So let's talk um, first of all about the, the, the quality, like with the way, so the, the quality in terms of a cost perspective. Mm. If you are willing to commit to a quality product, the cost is really a byproduct of the efficiency of it. So like in terms of how we produce the quality, because the quality is a big part of our sales. Sure. You know, like if you come into a Unity home, I believe there's a huge difference than if you go into our, one of our competitors. So this really starts from from the top, we've got a really, we've really worked hard to embed a corporate culture of there is no compromise on quality. So, mm -hmm. just to give you an example, we do inspections of our units, and inspections involve sort of 10, 15 people in the inspection. Now, I was involved for the bulk of the Unity West project myself mm -hmm. in those inspections, and this would literally be me on my hands and knees mm -hmm. inspecting tiles. There's one tiny little chip on a tile. We'd literally rip it up, do it again, rip it up, do it again, rip it up, do it again. A tiny little crack. Wow. So eventually this really just rubs off on people and it, I, eventually I don't need to do the inspection myself. People know if you put a tile down which is defective, it will be ultimately replaced. So mm. that's really sort of percolated down the organization and we've mm. really got a really um, uh, entrenched uh, um, culture of uh, quality. Mm -hmm. And the other reason on, on the, way we, the way we're able to produce a quality product is our systems and processes. We've worked exceptionally hard mm. um, to, uh, to uh, run everything as systematic as possible. We're obviously ISO certified. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, on each uh, project, we have what's called an inspection and test plan. This governs the inspections that we do. Mm -hmm. So for example, on, um, on our current project, we have 28 different checklists mm -hmm. before every house is handed over. Now these are not checks, these are checklists that are done. So, okay. so what this does is it ensures uniformity of inspection for a start mm -hmm. and informs that absolutely every square inch of that house mm -hmm. has been inspected and has been signed off. So there's, there's accountability to it. And it's and up to standard. It's absolutely up to standard. And I think, okay. I think if you ask anyone who's been into our estate, they will attest to the fact that our, quali our quality is that much better than, than, the, than what you see in the market. Amazing. Now, this brings me to the next question. Of course, executing all of this is not so easy. Um, you could have met a few challenges here and there in the Kenyan market and, of course, other markets that you serve. You mentioned Nigeria, rightly. So now the question becomes, what are some of the challenges you're facing in the Kenyan market and how are you mitigating around them and other challenges perhaps that are unique to other markets? Because I believe all these uh, jurisdictions are heterogeneous in their economic outlook. Yeah, the, yeah. So I think it's quite well documented. One of the biggest issues we have in the housing here, there's enormous demand. You, you laid out the demand. Sure. One of the issues is obviously the affordability and the, the cost of capital is too high. So you do not have a mm. big mortgage market. You know, in the Western world, more houses are just financialized. Mm. You speak to someone in the Western world, you tell people the market here is cash. Mm. They, they, act, they just don't believe it. Mm. So, you know, we've got a mortgage, we've got what, 30,000 mortgages of a population of 50 million people. I mean, okay. it doesn't even scratch the surface. Yeah, it's so not even that, a fraction. It's, it really is a fraction. Mm. So like, if we could work out how to bring the cost of capital down. Mm. Like I know there's been good initiatives, the KMRC is, is you know, there's, there's mm. people trying to solve this problem. Giving the bond market, yeah, and but uh, issuing know, bonds. But then, then, then this is the problem is obviously, you know, if the government's borrowing it's 12%, people are not really incentivized to go out and give mortgages at a reasonable rate. True. Which is why we just don't have a deep, we don't have a mortgage market here at all. Okay. Um, so that's obviously one very, very well publicized um, challenge. I'd say another one is, sort of on the execution side of things is maybe it's quite difficult to find particularly the quality that we want, the level of skills required to um, undertake the work. So mm. also, and this comes down to maybe some more vocational training mm -hmm. and really I would say championing, champion, championing the vocational training. A bit like, you know, if you look at Germany, for example, they've mm. really got a very uh, well-established vocational training. Mm -hmm. The UK, for example, doesn't. Now, if you look, one's an exporting uh, powerhouse and one can't export anything at the moment, can't manufacture anything. So I think the lack of skills is, is lack of good quality, well-trained artisans is definitely a challenge. Mm -hmm. And if there could be some sort of initiatives around more vocational trainings, mm -hmm. 
uh, that would be great. You know, even if we're actually at the moment looking at putting a training academy in our own mm. in our own business because oh, we really? realise this is a big risk to our execution moving forward. Is the sheer quantity of very skilled artisans. Uh, to get in the market. And that works to your advantage because at the end of the day you're training with standard procedures and measures that are acceptable under Unity Homes. Absolutely. Now the question then becomes, just a follow up on what you've just mentioned, do you find yourself having to outsource maybe from outside um, in, to get those quality uh, human resource? We are hu we are fully Kenyan. We don't want we don't <laughs> want to bring in foreigners. Okay. You know, like I like you know, we, I was actually I was in um, uh, Senegal the other day and looking around another site, mm. and one of them you know, they brought all these Indian tilers, for example. Like mm -hmm. we do not want to go down that route. We're fully we believe in Kenya. We believe in the story in Kenya, mm -hmm. and we we would prefer to train people here mm -hmm. and have Kenyans working on our site. Let's go back to the capital issue and, and of course look at the growth enter enterprise market of the NSE. Uh, the gems market, which is under the Ibuka program, um, there there are current entrants into it. I I'm not sure if perhaps Unity Homes has joined that, but the question then would be: Is the long-term goal to be part of um, the, the capital markets and being outsourcing from the capital markets? Yes, yeah, so we've joined the Ibuka program. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah, so what, one thing we're sort of sort of more near term we're looking at exploring now is the REITs, obviously mm -hmm. the listed REITs. So that, mm -hmm. that's something that's very inter interesting to us. We might then go down the route of maybe raising some debt on the, pa on the capital markets, some okay. sort of listed bond. Mm -hmm. And then we'd hope in future we go, we'd love to list in Kenya. There's a, at the moment, there's a, the valuations are quite low in Kenya. Okay. Obviously the cost of capital is quite high, so the valuations okay. are quite low. Mm -hmm. But we fully believe that that will change. The narrative around that will change, mm -hmm. at which time we'd love to list here. Great. Kenya has an ambitious plan to provide affordable housing for me and the other numerous uh, uh, number of Kenyans. Of course, I listed the demand earlier on. Um, you've talked about capital. What other areas are supposed to be, you know, streamlined to be able to afford uh, to, to give Kenyans that befitting dream of owning a home and providing housing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, one thing we discussed already, the mortgages. Um, 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 I would say more tax incentives for developers, mm. um, mm -hmm. that's the obvious one. Mm -hmm. um, and then a little bit of stability around the tax regime here. We mm. seem to, you know, <laughs> mm. you don't know what regime you're going to get next year in, exactly. when it comes to tax. So that table you're shaking has people's drinks. Yeah, 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 yeah no, exactly. So, <laughs> okay. so, that, so that's definitely an issue. Some stability and really clear um, uh, tax incentives that will encourage people to deploy large amounts of capitals because it, it is a big problem we need to solve here. Not even it's not even a Kenyan thing; it's a global thing. Oh, really? Housing is a there's, uh, housing is a global problem. Mm. We just don't have enough houses, mm. and particularly for uh, a country like ours, we're a very young demographic. The demographic is coming into the workplace. Mm. Yeah, they need to be housed. That mm. number mm. is getting bigger and bigger and bigger by the day. Yeah. So, so real estate is one of the most stable investment vehicles. Uh, absolutely. No, no. <laughs> This is Unity not Homes. Unity Homes is <laughs> the most stable. <laughs> and this is not financial advice. It's just information. I'm just putting it there. Okay, uh -huh. great. So how can Kenyans reach you and your organization? So uh, we're open every day of the week. We are our, our offices and our sites here at Tartu City. Okay. Um, we're, we've got a website, www.unityhomes.co.ke. Um, and then we're on Twitter, we're on all, all social media. But I would strongly encourage people to come out to our site and, and look at our product. It's, mm. it's, we don't like selling to people um, who don't come and see our products. I, don't, I think a lot of people won't believe the level of quality okay. until they come and see it. Question then would be, are there units for renting? For those not who yet. Afford? No, no, so there's obviously a rental market. We don't rent. So what, what we do is we sell okay. uh, and then we, we'll, we help not through ourselves, but we have some rental agents mm -hmm. who help our clients get tenants. And we do not have a problem with, with filling our, our estates. You know, as soon as the apartments are handed over, they're mm -hmm. occupied almost immediately. There's a huge demand for rent in that area. There's obviously the, the Tartu City story, but also people want to live in a very vibrant, safe community. And this is something we've worked really hard at providing, is a really, really good community. So we've got numerous initiatives and um, we've also got play areas for kids, and mm -hmm. um, we've got computer clubs, we've got libraries, you know, we're this, really trying to foster this sense of community mm. is very, very important, just to give people a really, really nice place to live. Gyms and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, gyms are coming, mini-marts is coming, we've got a swimming pool, mm -hmm. we've got a bar, 
Um, so yeah, so that, and that's a really big part of our, our story as well, is providing these amenities, these really world-class amenities mm -hmm. um, that encourage people to move into our estates. Finally, COVID. And yes, your, and your it's business. finished. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> COVID and your, no, it's, of course it's not over. But COVID and your business, really, how was that for you? Did you, did you have a restructuring of some of the mortgages mm. that you have? Or? No, so what was, COVID was really interesting actually. So when COVID first came, a bit like anyone, everyone, we thought the world was ending. Okay. We made plans to, to <laughs> wind down the work that we were doing. Okay. And then all of a sudden we saw this huge boom in, in sales. No way. Um, it was unbelievable. So, and this was, so there's a combination of, uh, we just finished our show home. So we'd show home, it coincidentally finished at exactly when COVID came. Okay. And obviously people had a little bit of time on their hands, so they come out to the site. But I think it was more the fact that people could, could come and now see mm -hmm. an actual home finished. Mm -hmm. And our business just, just took off. I mean, it really, you know, if we look at our business, let's say pre-COVID to basically pre-moving to Nairobi, and now it is utterly indistinguishable. You know, our business is so much more solid, so much more process-based, and so much better quality now than it was before. I'm sure you conducted some KYC. What were some of the financing methods that your clients were pursuing? Was it through circles? Was it through mortgages, bank finance, or cash? I don't know. Yeah, primarily cash. So some of them, we've seen some mortgages. The mor Most of the mortgages we see tend to be um, sort of government mortgages, parastatals, mm. Or the guys who work for the banks, they get subsidized mortgages. Mm. That mortgage system actually works. So those are the most of the financing is is through those uh, mechanisms. Otherwise, it's largely a cash business. Okay, mm. amazing. Thank you so much for your Good. insights on um, on Trading Bell today, and we wish you all the best in the growth enterprise market of Ibuka of NSE. All the best while at it. Thank we you have very been much. Speaking to Jason, one of the MDs right here at Unity Homes. Um, this is where we end Trading Bell. The next episode, of course, is next week, Wednesday. But before I leave you, I'm going to be giving you a look at how the markets are looking like here at the Bows. My name is Brian Jodotieno. See you on the next one. So the Institute for Certified Investment and Financial Analyst has come here in Mombasa for an amazing conference. That means all the major gurus when it comes to advising you in matters finance are here. And so I sought to seek from them what is their piece of advice to you as an investor that you should consider when it comes to such a year which is an election year in year. Please take a look at some of the comments that we got from the tops. We are in uh, Mombasa at the ISIFA annual conference. ISIFA is the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts and we're having the annual conference to discuss various matters affecting the market, industry and also the new trends happening all over the world. Now this is a very exciting year for the NSC given that uh, we do anticipate it's going to be um, a lot of election, election year, uh, we're going to see a lot of volatility in the market, we're going to see uh, investors take positions and so I'm um, appealing to our investors to take advantage of the market. We have seen these cycles before where we see a pre-election uh, low valuation period and a post-election high valuation periods and this provides you with an opportunity to create wealth. At the NSC we have invested heavily in the infrastructure that provides a very good ability for you to trade. We recently introduced day trading which we believe will be able to help you uh, buy and sell shares during the interday and these are the kind of um, initiatives we have in place to help the retail access the markets. I want to also appeal to the youth to take advantage of this market. You have time on your side. This is the time to invest. And this is the time that you can also help build uh, this market and your country. I think we are here to assure you that whatever investment classes, you just need to be very deliberate about your investments. Good time right now. It's important to have some cash or some money markets, emergency security money around you. And that's why it's important to check even with people like the Kenya Deposit Corporation just to make sure you're banking with banks that are registered and in money that you know. Avoid some of these online chamas and avoid a bit of the cons that come in during this time because of pressure around decisions to make a lot of money or to go and look for tender opportunities before the elections. 
I think the second asset class I'll talk about is the equity markets. Equity markets are already priced at this point, so they're already at their bottom. It's a good time to speak to your broker and find out what is available on equities. On the fixed income side, your treasuries, your treasury securities, both short term and long term, government is giving very good attractive rates. So keep an eye out, things like the infrastructure bond. If you have extra money and you can afford to lock it for a longer period, this is a good time to get into the bond market. And finally, as a Kenyan, I'd say perhaps this is not when you should be buying land and taking exposure in property. So before you do any one of those transactions, take a step back and pause and see if it's the right investment for you. Um, I think it's important to look beyond the elections and, and to know that uh, the, company, the country will still be functional and um, expectations of investors and, and, and the country in terms of um, normality of life will continue and, and that kind of perspective and, and will enable one to have a much more longer term view of uh, the investment opportunities that exist um, in the market um, and therefore the short term considerations shouldn't be a factor that should dissuade you from making uh, prudent investment decisions uh, and, and I think the question one would ask themselves is this time next year, two years down the road you'll be looking back at the investment decisions that you made and um, you would want to be um, in a position where you said you, you, know, you made a good call um, in terms of uh, the, the investment decisions that you made. So I think it's, imp it's very important not to be clouded by what we are seeing in terms of the, uh, especially the political aspect of it and I think it's important to look at um, the fundamentals of the companies and the, econ and the economy uh, so that you're able to make a rational um, investment decisions. My advice to people looking into investing is that you always look at the fundamentals of the company you want to invest in. So it doesn't matter if we're in an election period, I think you just go to back to the basics and look at the fundamental of the company, the leadership of the company, and then look at your own time horizon and determine whether that is an investment that would work for you. Uh, investment is a long-term journey, so that's something also to consider. So. We are three, four months to the election, but ride out the wave because you invest with a longer term vision. And so let's not forget that, even as we go towards the election. My name is Simon Nyakundi, uh, Managing Director, Kingsland Court, and the Chairman Association of Retirement Benefit Schemes. My advice to the investor at this point in time, in an electioneering period, I advice that it's a, it presents a very good opportunity for investors to pick uh, at this point in terms of investment. The stock market offers a very good opportunity at this point when even foreign investors are selling. It's an opportunity to pick because you'll get it at a low and uh, wait a bit and then you can be able to turn it around and make some money for your clients or you are in you as an investor would get uh, money uh, secondly it's also trading at a low at this point during an electioneering period uh, get in when people are getting out but also get in early so you pick it now it will be a very good return when you sell it